How the hell do the Draca keep winning? This is probably the single biggest gripe that people have about S.M. Sterling's Draca novels. The idea that this uh, grab bag of Anglosphere dregs could expand across all of Africa and then go on to conquer the world. It's a lot like that ridiculous story about the 13 American colonies becoming a world-mastering superpower. History is a collection of improbable things that happened. We already talked about technology and economics to some extent. But war isn't just about manpower, guns, and terrain. It's about assumptions. The landscape of the mind as much as the landscape of the theater of operations. We can broadly break this down into two parts. Objective and method. And let's use the Vietnam War for illustration. For a multitude of reasons, it was decided that the objective of the United States in South Vietnam was to prevent the South from falling to the communists. The method they chose to achieve that objective was to financially and militarily support the government of South Vietnam. But there are other ways to stop the communists from taking over. The United States could have directly occupied South Vietnam or completely destroyed the communist government of the North with a series of massive strikes. Or, in an extreme case, <coughs> depopulating the entire country would have been consistent with that basic objective of keeping the South from falling to the communists. The United States chose the most politically complex and fragile option because the United States of America doesn't view itself as an imperialist power or a genocidal monster. Self-perception makes those other options non-viable, not even open for debate. The Draca don't have that inhibition. At a cultural level, their goal is to conquer and enslave. They don't have to rationalize it to themselves, and this means that they have a very different calculus of war. The Draca were more successful than the British and the French at colonizing Africa because they had a self-image that allowed them to do brutal, horrific things without having to rationalize it to themselves, to convince themselves that they were still good people, or worry about what the public back home would think. If we look at the Eurasian War, the Draca did not defeat all of Europe. They waited while Europe bludgeoned itself into weakness, and then they grabbed key pieces that allowed them to exert control over much larger areas than they were actually able to directly occupy. And because they knew that their temporary allies, the United States and Great Britain, were not capable of turning around their populations to support a continued war with suddenly changed aims, they knew that they could risk overextending themselves. Between the Eurasian War of the 1940s and the final war of the late 1990s, the Draca engaged in one major terrestrial military campaign, the invasion of India. Of course, it's absurd that they would just roll into India like they own the place and own the place. Let's break down how they do it in terms of the established Draca method of conquest. First up, weaken the target. In this case, by exposing a plot of the United States to manipulate their elections. This revelation sparks political uncertainty and renewed support for the factions backing secession. We've stayed conspicuously peaceful, a snicker of laughter ran through the room, which put the secessionists firmly in power in New Delhi, just long enough for the ground and air units the Indians were contributing to the alliance to transfer their allegiance to the new Indian Republic, but not long enough for them to settle their share of the orbital assets. We've recognized the new government, and they've reciprocated. Nice of them. Another wave of chuckles. But once India severs ties with the Alliance, then the mask comes off. It begins with coordinated strikes on their military installations. The Draca don't have to divide resources uh, for multiple fronts. They know the Alliance isn't going to intervene. They can focus entirely on destroying the heavy military capacity of India. And so concludes the shock and awe phase of the campaign. But that doesn't mean that they actually control the territory. There are still millions of people 
including some large groups of military forces scattered throughout the country. The Draca only have possession of the military bases. But they have control of the borders, so very little can be brought in to supply those forces that are left. The Draca are also able to take control of or destroy the country's industrial capacity. The surviving Indian military will get very little resupply from outside. And this means that the Draca can take their time picking them off a piece at a time with Janissary troops. Janissaries are not cannon fodder. They are well-trained and fairly expensive to field, but they are slaves owned by the state. And consequently, the Draca are not concerned with public backlash when bodies start coming back in bags. The citizens don't care and the serfs don't get a say. This means that there can be a guerrilla war going on for decades and the Draca are prepared for that. They will gradually clear areas, open them for settlement, start awarding land grants, and any attack on those areas will be met with overwhelming force, up to and including nuclear strikes. Barcelona had risen against the yoke in 52. Hundreds of citizens had died and the last survivors had been pulled out by helicopter. An hour later, the city had gone up in a gout of radioactive flame. Snake idea of riot control, a one megaton sun bomb. In the meantime, if bands of resistance fighters want to run around the hinterlands, the Draco will sort of ignore them, but all the while will be pushing these deindustrialized people into ever smaller territory. It's the same approach they took after the Eurasian War, and some parts of Europe are still not fully pacified decades later. If large parts of the new territory are full of hostile bushmen, to use the Draco terminology, they'll just treat it as a hunting preserve until they're ready to aggressively clear it out. They don't have to get rid of all the people, they just have to disrupt them enough that they can't rebuild industries and become a viable fighting force. And the method scales. Whether we're looking at their expansion through Africa, their conquest of India, or their final attack on the entire non-Draca world, this model of warfare applies even to what they call the final war. Post-Eurasian War, the world is divided into the final two powers, similar to our Cold War, with the exception that there is no Third World War proxy wars are fought. Every skirmish is directly between the Alliance and the Draca forces, and therefore has the potential to quickly escalate into the final war prematurely. The Alliance is essentially an extended United States of America, culturally rooted in a classical liberal tradition that includes at least lip service to individual rights and a free market economy. They never really understand that their enemy has a fundamentally alien worldview to their own. They think they can negotiate with the Draca. They believe that a sufficiently strong show of force can bring them to the table, potentially even force them to surrender. They don't understand that for the Draca, it's a simple binary, either complete conquest or complete annihilation. There is no middle ground. There is no accommodation. There's no detente. The Draca plan for decades their death blow to cripple the Alliance before launching their final assault so that they might you know, trigger the final war and survive it. And this is where the game theory approach to war planning begins to crumble. Ultimately, world-changing decisions are made by individuals. And a human being is far from a purely rational actor. The quirks and prejudices of individuals come into play. We meet Eric von Schreckenberg in the first book, Marching Through Georgia, set in 1942 during a paratroop operation in the Caucasus. He shows up periodically throughout the rest of the series until toward the end of book three, The Stone Dogs, he is elected Archon, uh, roughly equivalent to president. Eric von Schreckenberg is not just a cardboard cutout slaver bad guy. In fact, he could be described as something of a liberal by Draca standards, which granted doesn't count for a whole lot. The domination has been good to him. He's wealthy and powerful. He's the patriarch of one of the oldest and most prominent Draca families. He's been involved in their master plan to defeat the Alliance since day one. But he also views his nation as profoundly evil at its core. When he decides not to launch the final war as scheduled, it's easily understood 
as a man unwilling to subject his people to the atomic fire that's going to rain down on their cities and estates. But he also knows that the long-term trends favor the Alliance. Deep down, it seems like he might not be too upset if the Draco were to lose. But in the end, it isn't up to him. Yolanda Ingolfsson, a high-ranking Draco official and Eric's niece, has her own motivations that merge the personal and the ideological. She forces their hand, ensuring that the Draco must launch their final war. And in the end, they are victorious, but it's a victory of cold rain and hot ash. No one among the victorious Draco can look around at the world that they've conquered and honestly believe that they're better off than the day before. They haven't even conquered the world for themselves, but for the new race that they've created to succeed them, genetically improved and no longer really human. We return to the idea that the Draca are a dark reflection of us, an anti-America. These two people, Eric von Schreckenberg and Yolanda Ingelsen, can be seen as representative of the tension between who we are as individuals and who we are as a nation. Eric was controversial in his country, whether for his less militant stance on the alliance or having had his surfborn daughter smuggled out to America so she wouldn't have to live as a slave. Draco was what he was, more than who he was. Yolanda, by contrast, was a hardcore patriot. She had no doubts about the ways of her people or the necessity of imposing them on the rest of the world. It dominated her emotions. All her anger, her fears, guilt, her need for vengeance was attenuated through that lens of her national mythos. She was in tune with that mythos. She personified it to some extent. She, like many Draca, believed in something. Something horrid to be sure, but a collective sense of purpose and kinship nonetheless. Our own nation has profound darkness in its history, but its very real sins are recognized as such. They're not part of the idealized perception we have of ourselves. At our roots, we have always aspired to be a free and open society, one where everyone has a chance and a voice, even when we have fallen far short of that ideal. All nations have their mythos, their spiritual essence, their egregore, if you prefer it, a cult flavor. When the experience of the people matches the mythos, as it does for the Draca, the nation draws a great deal of strength from that. They know who they are, they truly believe in their core values and they're willing to make sacrifices for them. They know what they're fighting for, and they believe it's worth fighting for. And I will leave you to take from that what you will. The initial plan had been to shoot this at an iconic American landmark, but... Well, this is uh, Mount Rushmore behind me. 